Let us pray. Our Father, we pray that you speak to our hearts once again at this time in Jesus' name. We pray that you make us like adults that understand when a father is talking and when you are telling us the things that you want us to do. Give us a ready spirit that will accept your word and follow after you. Help us that the only thing and the central thing we look for will be to please our Father who is in heaven. Be with us, O Lord, and we pray that these words will be written upon the tables of our hearts, that we will live lives that are acceptable in your sight, that all we do and say will be to the glory of your name, and nothing will hinder us of eternal rest and fellowship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning we are considering the word of God on a subject of scripture that all the Old Testament saints held dear in their hearts. They held it dear for a number of reasons. They held the subject dear to their hearts because of the environment in which they lived. They lived in an environment of idolatry, in an environment of darkness. And because of this, anyone that chose to follow the Lord and anyone that was called by the name of the Lord to become part of the working team in the Old Testament knew at the time they were following after the Lord that they needed to have complete trust in God and no trust in man. As you check up in the New Testament too, you will also find out the same thing that in a very special way, the apostles and the disciples trusted in God so fully and so completely. And they didn't have any trust or confidence in man. Again, this is because of a number of reasons. One, the foundation stones or the foundation members of the church, the apostles and the prophets, had lived with Jesus Christ himself. They had seen the power of heaven brought down to earth. And they had seen that their Lord and Master never trusted in any man. He always looked to the Father that sent him. His confidence was always in the God who is above. And he did not rely on anyone or anything on the face of the earth. His fullness of joy and strength came from the very throne of God the Father. And he needed nothing from people except their hearts that they will come, follow him, and believe. And because that these disciples had watched the Lord Jesus Christ so intimately, and they saw there was no form or shade or shape of trust in man, in the Lord Jesus Christ, they too, they followed after the Lord in that same way that they trusted completely in God without any trust in man, in any man. And so you will see that this is a subject that gets the attention of everyone in Bible days, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And God himself took it so seriously that he pronounced judgment, wrath, and curse upon the people that trusted in man. And so, for such an important subject that the people of Bible days held dear, we cannot overlook such a subject. So that's why we're looking at it today. We're looking at what the Word of God has to instruct us and remind us on the trust in man. 
in Jeremiah chapter 17 from verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Here God himself sent his prophet Jeremiah, and this prophet had a peculiar message, an unwelcomed message for the nation of Israel. And yet the Lord had told Jeremiah that he should not be afraid. He had heavy tidings for heavy-hearted, hard-hearted people. He had a great message from a great God, from the people that have greatly departed from the Lord. He had a message of rebuke, a message of judgment and correction for the people that refuse correction. And he was very young and tender, inexperienced and without support. And yet God told him, Jeremiah, do not say I am a child, but I am sending you to pull down and to build up. You will be to them, in the language of New Testament, the savor of life unto life, as well as the savor of death unto death. You will appoint some of them to live by your revelation. You will tell them, those who want to live, you'll give them what they will have to live. But Jeremiah, you will have to appoint some of them to die. Because you will declare that the whip or the scourge has been put in the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And he will come with his servants, and he will take them away into captivity. And they will suffer, and they will have the fulfillment of your prophecy. Not only for the time you are alive, they will have it for 70 whole years. Even after you have gone, every word I put in your mouth must be established even after you have left the scene, or you have left the stage, or you have gone away from the pulpit. To this young man, who had nobody, except God alone. In fact, if you read Jeremiah very well, you will see that there were no friends, just a secretary that followed after him. And the secretary would just write the word, publish the word, while he was in the dungeon. So that this word, unique message, that God had given to Jeremiah, will keep on being publicized or published or proclaimed. Whether he was allowed to stay in town or he was hidden in the dungeon. And it is one of these messages that God gave to Jeremiah that we're looking at today. He said in verse 5, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Here Jeremiah came and he told the people the error in the heart of unbelieving people. The error in the hearts of the people that have forgotten their God. The error in the hearts of the people that do not know Almighty God anymore. 
they have begun to trust in man. And Jeremiah said, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. In the case of Jeremiah, he meant a lot from this. There were other prophets that were rising up. And these prophets were bringing a false message to the children of Israel. They were telling the children of Israel, one of them said later, that the captivity will only be for two years. It will not be for 70 years. Jeremiah said, Amen. If that is coming from the Lord, then after that he said, You have deceived the people. You have made them to trust in a lie. And because you have made them to trust in a lie, you will not profit these people at all. And then he gave him a heavier message for the nation and for himself. He said, one, for the nation, you have broken the yoke of wood. You have fashioned and formed for them a yoke of iron. He said to you, and in there, you will die this very year. You see, a man that had a message like that, he had to fully trust in God himself. But these people were trusting in their false prophets. Not only that, there were dreamers that were coming into the nation. And these people had started trusting in the dreams of those dreamers. Again, Jeremiah told them that how can you compare chaff to the wheat? That the prophet that has a dream, let him tell the dream. But the one that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. It's not my word like fire. It's not my word like hammer. You see, he needed to contend with false prophets. These false prophets had started coming into the nation. And this nation, this nation had now started trusting in man, in the false prophet. Not only that, they had a governor that rejected the word of God. When they had read the word of God, this governor, this king, took that word and threw it in the fire. You see, Jeremiah lived at a time when the sound teaching of the word of God was not accepted or believed. But when that was done, God called on Jeremiah he said, Jeremiah, my servant, that king, governor, has burnt that um, role that you have sent. Write another one. This time, write it in full, within and without, inside and at the back. Send it to them again. And tell them, you have burnt it, but the judgment is still there. Jeremiah lived at a time when one of the governors was not really steadfast or steady. And he called Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, all these revelations you have brought, how did you get them? And he said, the Lord told me all these things, word by word. He said, tell me what I will do. Jeremiah said, if I tell you what you will do, will you not deliver me to the hands of the people? He said, I will not deliver you to their hands, but don't tell anybody what you are telling me. And don't tell anybody that I've called you. He lived at such a time when governors and kings knew the truth of the word of God, but they were not ready to publicly accept that thing. And because of that, they trusted totally in man. Not that they were totally ignorant of what were the demands of the law of God, but they did not have the backbone. They did not have the courage. They did not have the boldness that they will do and carry out the whole word of God. And this disease of trusting in man has become widespread in the whole nation. And so God now sent Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, go and tell them. This is a general common disease now over the whole nation, over all the people that call themselves by the name of the Lord. It says, tell them, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. What did God mean by trusting in man? He meant a lot. And a lot he meant, we see in this passage, and we also see 
in other passages of scripture and as we look at these passages of scripture with me this morning you will need to ask yourself the question where do you lean on which staff are you leaning on which chair are you sitting which is your confidence where is your trust where is your faith in this whole wide world do you believe that god alone is more than all the human beings in nigeria in africa in the world put together do you believe that if god what would be put on one scale and all the powers and authorities of the world that be were put on the other scale do you believe that that world with all the powers with all the authority of the powers of the world whether in politics or in banking or in wealth or in education if you put everything on the other side of the scale, do you believe that in comparison with God, they are like a grain of sand? If you don't, you'll be trusting in them. You'll be trusting in man. Because you do not really know God, you cannot trust in God. Whenever you have a need in your family, in your body, in your life, or around you an earthly need your mind will go to the one you are trusting in but it says cursed be the man that putteth that trusteth in man and then what are the evidences of trusting in man it says it there in verse 5 that maketh flesh is arm the arm is what we depend on what we lean on, what we eat with, what we work with. It means the person that puts all his life on the arm of flesh. Maketh flesh his arm. And yet the flesh that he makes his arm is an unstable flesh. It's a corrupting flesh, a corrupted flesh. And it says, whose heart departeth from the Lord. That really, he may know the promises of God, but really, he cannot stand on those promises. These are the characteristics of the people that trust in man. They depend on man completely. Their faith is in man. That man may be a religious false prophet. That man may be a religious seminarian. That man may be somebody that is irreligious. He might be completely flesh. He might be educated, of course, before a man will trust in another man. The man will think that the person he's depending upon has something he doesn't have. Before you can depend on a man, you must believe that man has something you don't have. You cannot depend on somebody or trust in somebody, have faith in somebody that you don't believe has anything more than you have. And in our churches, those who have trust in man, if you are a preacher, if you are a pastor, it means that you believe as a pastor, the person you are trusting in has something you don't have. And you cannot get except through him. That's the curse. Because your heart has departed from the Lord. You do not believe that all blessings, all good gifts and perfect gifts, they come from above. From God, with whom there is no shadow of variableness, no change at all. Your heart trusts and depends upon man upon the arm of flesh if you do not see them you feel there is something that has been taken away from you you feel that you cannot stand you feel you cannot live 
you feel you cannot work. You feel that your life, your career, your ministry will collapse, except those men are there to give you continual support. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, that maketh flesh his arm. A lot of people that they depend upon what Satan has originated. Well, we know that Satan is the originator of all the religious societies and religious groups that do not make Jesus Christ the center of their faith and preaching. Satan is the originator of any religious assembly, religious organization that does not make Christ the center of the message and the center of life eternal. And yet do you know that there are people that put their trust in what Satan has originated? And cursed be the man that trusteth in man, that maketh flesh his arm. Do you know also that all unbelievers, all the money they have got, before they came to the Lord, all the name, all the popularity that they have got before they came to the Lord, the strength by which they got it were not, is not from the Lord. Many of them went into occultism before they got their money. Many of them got into evil things, magical things, before they got the money, the wealth, the popularity, many of them used violence before they now before they had some respect in society, acceptance in society. Now they might have come to the Lord, but they have brought their wealth and popularity and fame with them. But understand the origin of the money that they now spend. The origin of the popularity and the fame they now depend upon came from the devil before they were born again. And yet there are people, there are Christians so-called that will depend on these people. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. It says in verse 6, He shall be like the hares in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh. When you depend upon man, no matter who the man may be, you will not see when good from heaven is coming. Now when I talk about good, I'm talking about what God judges to be good. There are a lot of things that God does not count good, that you may count good. For example, friendliness with the world, you may count as good. When all men are praising you and they are loving you and accepting you, you may think that is good, but that's a curse in itself. Woe unto you. When all men praise you, for so did they, to the false prophets that came before you. Woe unto you, when all men appreciate you, when you tell us that now even occultic people, religious people, unsaved people, now they appreciate you, you're under the curse already. There are some things that people think may be good, but in the evaluation, examination of heaven, they are evil. And so when the Bible says, he shall be like the earth in the desert and shall not see when good cometh. Other people will think that if you have a lot of money, they think that is good. But don't you know, if a man has more money than he needs, it's a curse on him. If a man has money that withdraws his affection from God, that lessens his ability to have faith in God. That lessens his ability to trust in God. If a man has money and the things of this world 
that makes him not to desire to go to heaven at any moment. That money is a curse. But people do not realize, they feel that if you have money, they think that that is what the Bible is calling a good thing. They think if you have more friends and many people are praising you, they think that is a good thing. They say, but I trust in man. And since I trusted in man and I've used my common sense or maybe they call it sanctified sense to get all these people around me, now many good things have been coming. Now I have many friends. Now I have a lot of money. More than I need. No, it's still part of a curse on you. Whenever you don't have any need to take to the Lord in prayer, you're under a curse. Whenever you don't have something like persecution that will drive you to your knees and say, Lord, help me out and ask for more grace. Whenever you don't have something, a fire burning, a persecution behind your back that will lead you to seek the face of the Lord and more of the grace of God, you're under a curse already. A person that is not persecuted by the world, not abused by the world, not reproached by the world, but embraced and married to the world, that's a cause in itself already. And the people that trust in man, the reason they do that is that they want to avoid persecution. You won't want to avoid persecution if you want more grace, if you want more time to pray. If you want more ability to depend upon God, if you want to discover more of heaven, you will not want to avoid persecution. The people that try to avoid persecution, the way you do it is that you trust in man. You make flesh your arm and your heart departs from the Lord. You cannot see when good cometh but shall inhabit parched places in the wilderness and in a salt land and not inhabited. What the Bible is saying here is this, that the man that trusts in man will be living in the wilderness. You see, when you trust in man, you have to attend their ceremonies. The man you trust in has got a new child and he wants you to attend the dedication. So you have to go into his wilderness. A wilderness is where the flowing water of grace is not available. The regular manner of life is not available, the bread of life. And the regular supply of ointment and anointing is not available. There may be the pomp and there may be the um, evil things that they're doing, the eating and the drinking. That's exactly what Jesus said. He said, beware, lest the day of the coming of the Lord comes upon you unawares. For men will be eating and drinking, marrying and, mar and giving in marriage, until that day comes upon them without their preparation. A man that trusts in man will be going from wilderness to wilderness. He'll be going for naming ceremonies, funeral ceremonies, marriage ceremonies, because the man that he trusts in, when they want to have their ceremonies, he has to be there. It doesn't matter that those people have not, gone, have not done things in the right way. Oh, he says, that person is one of the people that I can never disappoint. Put him in my heart. It's a special place, and that fellow is just a backslider, a sinner. And even if the person were a believer, you are not to trust in a believer. You are to trust in the one he believes in. You are not to put your faith in a fellow believer. You are not to put your faith in any man. You are to put your faith in the living God. But they'll be going to the wilderness. They go to eat there and eat there. They might even be sending their children to spend holidays with the men they trust in. Oh, they say, my children, that's a family friend, family friend that doesn't know God, family friend that will not stand on the totality of the word of God. And they send their children there, they say, go and spend holidays there. They don't care what negative, bad influence that that other family will have on their children. They've come to trust in man to the point that they are totally blinded. And they dwell in the wilderness. It says, 
in a land of salt that is not inhabited, where you won't find the grace of God, where you won't find the angels of God, cursed be the man that trusteth in man. It says, blessed be the man that trusteth in God, whose hope the Lord is. Whose hope the Lord is. He wants to get married. His hope is in the Lord. His hope is not in a daddy or mommy in the local church. His hope is not in a godfather that will recommend for him somebody to get married to. His hope is in the Lord. When he's sick, his hope is not in the doctor that is coming to the church, the medical doctor that has not even fully given his life to the Lord. His hope is not in the nurse that is coming to the church. His hope is in the Lord when he gets sick. When he gets sick, the first thing he will do is that he will go on his knees and he will pray. He will say, God, now I am sick. How will I get well? By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. But the man that gets sick, and the very first name he remembers, he remembers that brother so-and-so is a doctor, sister so-and-so is a nurse. And all their confidence is in the doctor and the nurse that is attending that place of worship. When the wife is pregnant, the very first person that their mind will go to is that, well, there is that person in our church, there is that person in our church, he can help me out. They never think about God. They think that God is not involved in any of those things, in healing their wives or healing their children or healing anyone. Their total hope is totally in the people in their fellowship. But the person that is trusting in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is, a person that has hope in the Lord, if he's a pastor, he looks during the month, maybe at the, on the 15th of the month, 20th of the month, he sees that the time will I get my allowance for this month. Because the tithes and offering, they're not even enough to roll the Bible study outline that we have during this month. But a person that is trusting in man will say, in any case, I know that brother so-and-so is there. I know it's... Um, a person that has a good bank account, if uh, things don't work out, I will have to talk to that man. These people are not like those who have read about in days gone by. The people that will even sit on an empty table and pray and say the grace and expect that the food will come in. The people that never beg. But today, people don't have their hope in the Lord. We have uh, people here, we call ourselves workers. You are planning your marriage. And as you are planning your marriage, you know that the money is not there. But you know what to do. You know a name in that state, a name in that state, a name in that state. And then you type out some things about your marriage. You send a card with it. And you say, well, uh, help us pray on these items now. Help us pray that God will provide the money we're going to spend in buying the furniture. Help us pray that God will give us the money we're going to spend for this. You're not telling them you're begging them, but your trust is in them. And then you will say, please pray for me, and please pray and surrender yourself to the Lord. The Lord may use you to meet this need. It's not the Lord using them. It's your letter influencing them. Your trust in man. You cannot conduct your marriage without writing to all these various states and the people that you know and the car owners without, you cannot conduct your marriage without writing to them. Now we want to build church buildings. And right now, people that trust in man, they cannot go on their knees. They spend more time trying to plan, trying to think out. And they think if I can write to that person, write to that person, if we can dig the foundation by faith. And we get all these pastors and all these state overseers invited on the, at the day of the digging of the foundation. And then while they are there, we give a moving message and we quote some parts of the Bible. Please understand that you have ability to quote the Bible doesn't mean you are a Christian. 
the devil uses the Bible too whenever it will suit his purpose. And as you bring all that together, you give a message and you say, I believe that these people that are with me on the platform, they will, be, they will have a part in the work of the Lord. And uh, they are preachers themselves. They will lead the example. And they are deeper like people. We are all together. They will lead the example. I know some of them will be able to give, who knows, 50,000. The Holy Ghost is speaking to their hearts now. My friend, you are not working for God. You'll be surprised on the last day. Everything you are trying to build, you know, your work will pass through fire. The fire will burn everything. That's not working for God. God said, be the man that trusteth in man. Lay your foundation if you want to, but look up to God. Look up to the hills from whence cometh your help. But the people that try it all about, and their trust is in man to get money or to get anything. But these people, when you are trusting in the Lord, it says, whose hope the Lord is. There are people that they want to do something in the church. Maybe you want to uh, get your search the scripture from Lagos here. You want to get literature from Lagos here. You want to get some things. Or you want to buy an organ. Or you want to buy this and that. Well, you happen to know there's somebody overseas. Instead of praying, doesn't that need prayer? We want to buy an organ. Doesn't it need prayer? Or do we just say, well, since we know that man is overseas and he can arrange that for me, why do I need to waste God's time talking to him about this, that I have somebody over there? That's what I'm saying. That's your God. You have replaced God with the man over there. We cannot pray on that anymore now. You want to buy an organ? You want to buy church equipment? You want to buy a lot of things? Where is your hope? Why are you trying to buy something for the church that you don't have money to cover? Are you trying to help God? You put God, you buy something for God on credit? Or is God like your wife that you buy rice for your wife on credit? That you don't have the money and then you go into debt. You say it is for God. God needs to be put on credit. So that God doesn't have the money. God cannot build his church. God cannot buy an organ. God cannot do all these things we need in the church. We put our hope in somebody richer than God. And we say, well, God doesn't have it at present. Therefore, you must help God out and help us out. And this, don't disappoint me. God has disappointed already. But let's, uh, let's lend him this money. And the church and God will pay you later. The people that borrow money from members of the church, they want to do something in their family, they want to do something in the church, they must borrow money from members of the church. Their God cannot supply all their needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I, I tell me, did Peter borrow money from Ananias and Sapphira? He knew they were there before. He said, while these things remain, were they not your own? He knew they had the money. Did he go to them and said, Ananas, help us out? Barnabas, Joseph, he had the money. They knew he had the land. They even called him the son of consolation. Did the apostles become the servant of the rich people and say, bail us out, help us out, lend God? Let's borrow money from you to do the work of God, to pay for the work of God. Are we not beggars then? Are we not like the uh, white garment uh, prophets? They take a cup in their hand. They take a plate in their hand. They come on the street with their robe and their, their belt and with the rod in their hand. And they stop the car. They say, stop, stop there, stop there. Or, since you have been passing this place, you see that a building is going on here. You never help the church money here. That's what you are doing now. Going about and begging, training our people how to put, how to do Bob a job. Bob a job. 
That is, we put plates uh, in the hands of our members. We say, go and be knocking on their doors. God won't supply the need. We must do something. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, that maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. O blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For it shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. The heat will come. But the man that is trusting in the Lord will not see when heat cometh. If you are not trusting in the Lord, what you'll discover in your life is that drought and heat and famine and necessity and nakedness and poverty and curse will be rampant in your life. You'll be going from one need to the other. You'll be going from one man to the other. And apart from that, all the men you are trusting in will not trust in you. You lose their confidence. The people you are borrowing money from as a worker, as a zonal leader, the people you are borrowing money with as a preacher of the gospel, they will not have any confidence in you. They will not trust you. They will just count you as a beggar, as a borrower. And eventually they will be having a lot of problem with you. When you say the church will pay back, the church doesn't pay back, they will be looking at the whole church as a debtor, owing them money. And they will not take the standard of the word of God. They know that they are there as God's assistant. They are not there as members. They are there as God's assistant. So that any time that God is not able to do it, will come to his assistant and say, Well, assistant of God, uh, God is not supplying now. Assist him at this time so that when you have given us, later we'll pay back to you when God is ready. God is always late for your church. God is always late for your very life. And so we need to understand that God doesn't want us to replace him by anyone. If you want to really see prosperity in your life, by prosperity I don't mean having a lot of money, having all the money so that you'll be able to pay national debt, that will be a curse. When you have so much money like that, when you become a millionaire, it's a curse. Because your mind will be there. You will not be able to set your affections in th on things above. You'll be setting your affections on things on earth. God is not going to give you something that will damn your soul. When I talk about prosperity, I'm talking about God meeting the necessities of your life. Not millionaire, not having too much money. Too much money will damn you. Just enough money to take care of your necessities and your basic needs. But you see, when people are not trusting in the Lord, they do not know the supply of the Lord. If you want to know God's prosperity plan, and you want to see him supplying the need of your life and of your church, then you will trust in him. Because it says, you will not see when heat cometh, her leaf shall be green. But if you are trusting in man, the leaves will be dry. You can never make up with any money that you borrow. The work of God will never be done by any money that you beg. God doesn't use that. God doesn't use that. What do you think? That you are married to a wife. And you have the money. But this woman will not keep a close relationship and contact with you. And then went out to beg for money. Went out to plead for money. Not only that she went out to plead for money, she even saw some of the people that have been making fun of you, ridiculing you, and did not believe and accept everything you have said, went to borrow money from them, and then cooked the food. And he set the food on the table for you. If you are a real husband, you won't eat that food. You'll say, throw it away. Here is money. You are my wife. You want to cook for me? Here is money and get real food. This one that is coming from an enemy, this one that is coming from the people that you have befriended, and I told you that you shouldn't befriend them. 
that they are not friends to the family. This money that you have got by begging as if you are not married to somebody who is qualified to get married, this money, I can't eat that food. All this money you are getting, do you think God will use it? You, you borrow the money to raise up a building. Do you think God will use the building? You get all the money from the people that have occultism and they are not living right and then you are saying you are doing something for God. Do you think God will bless it? You want to have a crusade and you have to borrow money from all these other churches. The churches that are burning candles, the churches that depend on holy water, the churches that have their polygamy, the churches that have a lot of things will say, we are together. Well, if we are together, you are separated from God. God will not bless that work. All those things that we are getting from all these people that we depend upon, you put it in the work of God, you ruin that work. Because the Lord will not use that type of method. Therefore, your leaves will be dry. And the work will be dry. And it says, shall not be careful in the year of drought. Oh yes, there is a year of drought. But the person that trusts in the Lord will not be anxious. Will not be worried. Will not be full of cares will not be full of anxiety, will not be careful in the year of drought. At the time of retrenchment, at the time of the economic crunch, at the time when things are difficult in the year of drought, the man, the woman that trusts in the Lord will not be anxious, will not be careful. He will depend upon the Lord. And he will know that my help cometh from God. Because he can help. Famine doesn't affect God. Drought doesn't affect uh, God. It says neither shall cease from yielding fruit. You see the people that trust in men. They come to the church and they tell us that. Well now we cannot continue our programs. We are going to stop from bearing fruit. Because this is, things are difficult, this is the year of drought, this is the year of famine, and there's nothing we can do anymore now, and you church people, you have the money, you are hiding it somewhere, help us out, if you want us to bear fruit, if you have the money and you are in their church, don't help them, if you help them, a curse will come on you yourself, because they are making you God, they are worshipping you. And if you are the one that a pastor, a preacher uses to replace God and you accept it, don't you know what happened to Herod? When Herod came out and he spoke and he said, that is the voice of a God. When he accepted what the people said and they replaced God with him, the angel came and smote him. If a pastor, if a preacher knows that you have money and you know you have the money, and you see that that preacher is always coming to your house, is always telling you indirectly, my family has this need, my, the church has this need, this one has this need, we couldn't do this now. And it's always telling you, and you see by the Spirit of God in you, if you are a Christian, that this preacher is not making you God. If you respond to that need, if you give him that money, if you give that church that money, a curse will come upon you yourself. Because he makes you a God and you accept you are God. He says that God cannot supply the need. You are the one that can supply the need and you accept it. The angel of God will smite you. If the people come, remind them if they are your preachers, they come asking you for money, begging you for money, just ask them a question and say, Sir, is our God dead? That will challenge the preacher. Just ask them and say, cannot God supply our needs anymore? That will challenge that preacher. Just tell him, is what we're doing beyond the plan of God? If he planned it, cannot he bring funds to accomplish it? That will send them back on their knees. But they come to you making you God. That's not why you're in the church. You didn't come to deeper life to finance deeper life. You didn't come to deeper life to build up deeper life. It is Christ that builds his church. Upon this rock, I build my church. 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If you build it, without God building it, the gates of hell will prevail against that church you are building. They make you God. They make you the supplier. You don't pray anymore. You are the ones, the rich people that are supplying the needs of those churches. You are the ones that don't allow that church to progress, to pray. You do not know the power of prayer anymore. And you allow them to trust in you. And every time you are going to the pastor and you are saying, Pastor, any need again? Anything I can do now? Where are you going? If you know you want to do anything, why did you not put the money in the offering bag without the pastor knowing? You want to buy a position? You want to buy the church? You want to buy a slave? You want the pastor to become your slave? You want to buy him over? If you have any money you want to put, put it there between you and God without anybody knowing. Why are you coming to us and saying, can I do anything? If you want to do anything, go and do it. Why do you come to us? Can I give any money? If you want to give any money, that's between you and God. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. You want to buy us over? You want us to be your slave? Don't do that in this church. It is Christ that builds the church. And when Christ is building the church, it says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against that church. A real believer will not have any trust in man will trust in the Lord completely. In Psalm 146, Psalm 146, from verse 3, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. You see, the Bible knows about princes. Now we are the people that take a lot that depend a lot on political people. And you know, a preacher will say, well, he'll come to his church and he will say, uh, last week there was an appointment booked for me. I had the privilege of meeting the governor of our state. What a curse on you. What have you gone to see him for? To preach the gospel to him? To tell him without holiness no man shall see the Lord? Or to beg you're putting your trust in princes. You're putting your trust in the people that think they can do something for you. Oh, and they say, yes, we've heard about that church. We will help that church. No, sir. No human being, no unsafe man can help the church of the living God. It's only God that can help his church. No polygamist, no sinner, no cultic man prince or governor can help the church of the living God. Yes, God can use anyone, but it's God. It's not the people determining. If God uses anyone, he will do it even against his own will. Not the one that will cringe and beg and crawl and prostrate and change our message and say, uh, we tell the ushers that, uh, you know, so and so is in church. Do you recognize him? No, sir. Uh, well, that person is an important personality. Give him a special place and get some of the brothers that are well dressed and some of the sisters sit with them. And then during that, the message you prepared before, immediately you know that so and so is in church, you modify that message. Because that message is not good enough for that man. He must get something that has no salt, something that has no pepper, something that has no water, something that has no nutrient, something that is just chaff, big with education. You damn their souls, and your own soul will be damned. Put not your trust in man. The same message that saves a poor man will save the rich man. There's only one way to salvation, only one way to God, only one way to heaven. If we have to water down the message, if we have to take all things relating with sin out of the salvation message, there is no salvation. If we have to take everything relating to holiness from heaven, and we're just describing how beautiful heaven is, but there's no holiness in the description. There is no message there. 
if we take away the Bible, the real word of God that brings conviction from the message we are preaching, doesn't matter where you are preaching it, if you take the real thing away, there is no message again. And it is because of trust in man. It is because we need to get that man. Why do you need to get that man? Do you know whether he will be saved? Not everybody in the world will be saved. Why do you leave the thousands of people in front of you to preach the real message to the people that are asking, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You leave them alone and you are concentrating on a man that only came for sightseeing, only came to see, oh, that church is there and it's going all about so that at the time when politics uh, has come, when the ban on politics is lifted, he will be able to say, I'm a member of Deeper Life, I'm a member of Celestial, I'm a member of Anglican, I'm a member of CAC, I'm a member of Baptist, I'm a member of all the churches because he has gone to register in every church. Didn't you know? And then the pastor might even allow him to come and greet the congregation. He's looking for your vote and he's using you. He's using you like a person for like a person that will campaign for him, that will touch your church members because if he can get you and you tell your church members, if he can get that other pastor and they tell their church members, then they will come and rule over you. That's politics. But preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And because they have itching ears, they will heave to themselves, teachers, having itching ears. But you do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Put not your trust in man, in princes, nor in the son of man, in whom there is no hell. Isaiah chapter 30. From verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame. The trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your confusion. When we trust in man, we'll come to shame. The shadow and the strength of Egypt, upon which we're depending, will bring us to shame and confusion in Isaiah chapter 31. Isaiah chapter 31 from verse 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. When you want to get married, where do you go for help? When you are looking for employment, where do you go for help? You say you are a pastor, you are a zonal leader. Who are the people that help you, that stay on horses and trust in chariots? Because there are many. And in horsemen, because they are very strong, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord, yet he also is wise, and will bring evil, and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers, and against the help of them that work iniquity. God will work against the help of workers of iniquity that are trying to help you. Now, the Egyptians are men. They are not God. These men in which you put your trust, the ordinary men, they are not God. Their horses are flesh. They are not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that is helped shall fall down. And all they shall fail together. The one you are helping and you the helper. That's why I told you. If you allow a man to make you God. If you allow a man to 
trust in you, you will fall and he will fall. And God will bring judgment upon the arm of flesh that is trying to help you as well as upon you receiving help from human beings or seeking help from human beings. Now, trusting man brings some other things into our lives. One, it brings fear of man. You see, when you're trusting a man, you do not want to offend him in your messages, in your actions, in your trances. When you trust in man, your eyes are not set upon the living God. It will make you to be a slave. It will make you to have fear of man in your heart. Because trust in man brings subjection to man. Men like to have slaves. And they like to have people that trust in them. So they can enslave them. People of power. People of wealth. People of prestige will have strings upon you. They will tie strings on you. They will take, dictate how far you go, how far you don't go. Once they know you are trusting in them, and they know it, you know your slaves, they know their slaves. Once they know you are trusting in them, they will tie strings on you. Trust in man will lead them to attempt so that they can bring you under their influence. And indirectly, they'll be discussing your messages from you, with you, when you see them during the week, because they know you will soon come. And you might also have gone to the habit of asking them, were you there on Sunday? Because anytime they are not there, it's like God is not there. You're unhappy. Why didn't uh, Brasso and so come today? Is it that I offended him during the week? Is, is it because the money we borrowed from him we have not paid back? Is it because of what I preached last Sunday? Has he been offended? There will be a lot of questions in your mind. And eventually you want to get to him in a hurry and see him. And you say, and say ah, brother, were you there on Sunday? Oh yes, I was there because I came late. I sit in another place where well, I thought you didn't come. How was the message on Sunday? Well, he has to pass comments. If his comments are not favorable, you have to change. He has such influence on you. You see, when you trust in man, it only takes a little time. It may take a few months, and he will bring his influence heavy to bear upon you. He will cause you to move according to his own dictates, according to his own intention. You will not be getting your blueprint and your plan from God. You'll be getting your plan from that man. And so, when you trust in man, it brings some things into your life. Look at some of the things it brings. Number one, I told you, the fear of man. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth its trust in the Lord shall be saved. You can see the, different, the two parts of that verse. It says on the one side, the fear of man. And then it contrasts it. It distinguishes it from the trust in the Lord. On the one hand, the fear of man. But the person that doesn't have the fear of man, he is the one that is putting his trust in the Lord. But the one that is not putting his trust in the Lord is the one that will have the fear of man. And it brings a snare. It will bring you into a snare, into bondage, into slavery. Not only that, it makes you to give pleasing, flattering titles to people. In Job chapter 32, Job chapter 32, verse 21, Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. You see, when you have trust in man, when you have confidence in man, you like to be praising them, flattering them. You'll be using all you have, 
all the intelligence and the wisdom you have in lifting up all those people, flattering them. You can do it in the church. You can do it for your pastor while you are leading the prayer request. And you see now we're going to pray for our pastor, the great man of God, none like him in this state, not like him in Nigeria. My friend, that is flattery. You are looking for something. You are not, you don't have God. Other times, you see when other people are there, now we're going to pray for, you know, the women, especially our pastor's wife. What a great woman, what a great support. My friend, you are a sinner. All that you are doing is not sincere. You are, you are giving flight train titles. You are trusting, man. You are looking for something. That's the reason you are doing it that way. We can pray for people. We pray for people every Sunday in our church. We pray for the sick. We pray for their need, what they really need. We pray for the people that are jobless. We pray for what they really need. We pray for people that are not born again. We pray for what they really need. And we don't say to impress them. We just say somebody sent in this prayer request is sick. And now we call upon the Lord on his behalf. We don't use adjectives and qualify this and qualify that. You turn the church into a church that flatters man. That flatters and it may be anybody, it may be general superintendent, or it may be state overseer, or just the local pastor. You don't have a right to flatter the pastor. You don't have a right to flatter general superintendent. If you do, God will soon take you away. He says, let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person. Neither let me give flattering titles unto man. Any man, whether in the church or at the crusade or anywhere, we don't give flattering titles. Since you came to this workers' retreat, did I introduce myself to you? Did I tell you this is the great man? No, I'm not great. I'm a small man preaching about a great God. When I was coming in there, as I was approaching, the usher there standing there, I greeted him. He wanted to leave the place. He thought I was an usher that wanted to take his place. But that's all right. Let the greatest of you be, be your servant. But I didn't tell the man, well, I'm not an usher. I am so and so. There's no so and so here. Let us not give flattering titles to so and so, to so and so, to so and so. Preach the word. Once you have preached the word, you don't need the praise of the people. What you need is that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Or when Peter preached, did he say, believe on me, so that you will be saved? Did he say, no name given among men by which we can be saved except Jesus and Peter? It's Jesus alone. Jesus alone. Not Jesus and general superintendent. Not Jesus and state overseer. Not Jesus and pastor. Jesus alone. That's the name given among men by which we can be saved. But all these other things that have come into your life. That you are not looking for something. And unfortunately, you don't do it when, you, when the pastor is not there. At the back, you don't have any respect for that man. But when he's there, the flattering titles. He says, I don't know how to do it. Giving flattering titles to man. He says in verse 22, For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker will soon take me away. You cut your life short when you trust in man. And it is the trust in man that brings all these things into the lives of people. In Psalm 118, verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Better to trust in the Lord. Here we are this morning. The Lord is calling upon us that we need to trust him. And why shouldn't we trust him? He can meet our need. All needs. When we need chastisement, he meets that need. When we need persecution, when the persecution needs to make the Christian to go on his needs, he supplies our need. When we need to know that we are humble and that we are nothing at all, and we need to recognize our shortcomings, 
And we need to see how dirty we are. It's only God that can meet that need in our lives. When we need some necessities of life. When we need a little withdrawal of money. So that we don't have money. We don't have anything. It makes us to concentrate and remember spiritual things. He withdraws the things that is making us to forget spiritual things. He meets our need. When we need a little delay in the supply of the things of this world, and that little delay will humble our hearts and get us on our knees, he meets that need. And when we need a little amount of money, we don't need much, just a little. When we need to marry a wife, we don't need two, we need just a wife. When we need the grace of God to be able to live a righteous life, he supplies all our need. When he can supply all your need like that, why don't you trust in him? Why don't you say, Lord, when I need a weep, I know it's in your hand. When I need the word, I know it's in your hand. When I need wisdom, I know it's in your hand. When I need some little, little things, I know it's in your hand. You can meet all my need. Why don't you then trust him? I know that when you need sunshine, he meets the need. When you need rain, he meets your need. When you need conviction, he meets your need. When you need sorrow of heart, it is a sorrow of heart that purges the heart. Joy and laughter will dry you up. If God gives you laughter every time, every day, as he preaches to you, as he gives the word to you, he gives you laughter and joy every time, it will destroy you. No successful man will be laughing every day. A man that is preparing for something serious will weep a few times, laugh a few times. When you need laughter, it will supply your need. When you need tears, when you need sorrow of heart, when you need discipline and chastisement, he supplies your need. And you see, that's the beauty of the Christian life. And it says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And as you trust in him, and you say, Lord, I'm your child. Here am I. I want to make heaven at all costs. Supply all the things into my life, physical, material, spiritual, that will help me to make heaven. He will supply that need. This morning, I'm calling you as a whole church back to come and trust in God. Remove your trust from man. You have been sinning by putting your trust in man. You have been sinning by putting all your confidence in people. You have been sinning by forsaking God, turning your back on God, and putting your trust in human beings. Repent this morning and say, Lord, we want now to trust you. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. My son, give me thine heart. Let's rise up and pray. And be sincere in your prayer. In any way you've been putting your trust in man, repent. And say now I want to put my trust in God. Now I will put my trust in God. Cursed be the man that puts his trust in man. Whose heart departeth from the Lord. In your planning marriage, where you put in your trust? In looking for employment, where do you put your trust? In organizing your wedding, where do you put your trust? In taking, in taking care of church finances, where do you put your trust? Are you trusting in princes and personalities? Are you making a man your God? Amen. Our Father and our God, you have talked to us as a father. Lord, you've spoken directly to our hearts. You're bringing us back to yourself. Lord, we have sinned against you. We have taken our hearts away from you. Lord, we have trusted in many things. And yet, Lord, it's because we've removed our eyes from you. Because at the time we started, 
we had confidence in you that as you have spoken to us today, we'll come back to you in Jesus' name. Yeah.